in heaven, we pause now to ask your presence to come here and be our instructor. Father, we want to thank you. You've been with us already every night, and we anticipate and expect that you will be with us again this evening. Father, as we pull back the curtain that separates the seen from the unseen, as we pull back the curtain that separates this world from the eternal world, as we see the war that is behind the wars, we pray tonight that we would see that this is not just an intellectual truth or a concept, but this is a war that we are very much involved in ourselves. Father, may we be making decisions, daily decisions, that plainly align ourselves with Christ and with you. Please, Father, be with us now. As we open your word, we're asking you to open our hearts. In the marvelous name of Jesus Christ, let everyone say, Amen. 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 Excellent. Now, last night, just as we were closing, I realized that I did not get through the last two paragraphs of last night's presentation. I originally thought, well, you know what we'll do is we'll spend the first part of tonight doing that. But actually what we're going to do is just sort of spend a little time in review, and my hunch is that you will be able to figure out those uh, blanks from last evening's presentation. And if you're not, you can come and ask me about it personally, and I'll help you to fill them in. So let's go right to the introductory paragraph on tonight's study guide, right to the introductory paragraph. It says, in the last two lessons we learned that there is a great what, everyone? battle, waging between the forces of light and darkness, good and evil. Now that might sound a little bit like Star Wars to you, but this was occurring long before George Lucas came on the scene. Satan's undiluted fury is being poured out upon this planet. We saw that last night in Revelation chapter 12. We read the whole chapter through and saw that. He has already been cast out of heaven and is now confined to where, everyone? To this planet. If we are to withstand the increasing and ongoing attacks of the devil, then we must have a potent and powerful weapon to employ. Fortunately, the book of Revelation promises just such a weapon. In this lesson, we will learn about this important weapon. Look with me at the screen here, just by way of review. We have learned that all of the evil in the world is traceable to a rebellion. Lucifer, an exalted angel, made the choice to rebel against God and became Satan, or Satan, the fallen foe. Last night we looked at the six stages of the great battle, this great conflict that exists between the forces of light and darkness and good and evil. The victory was declared, who remembers where, everyone? In the Garden of Eden. That's exactly right. Remember there, Genesis chapter 3, 15, God comes into the garden. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and it will crush your head. The victory then began in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Remember Luke chapter 11? He said, when a strong man is guarding his house, then everything is fine. But when a stronger than he overcomes him, he could spoil his goods. And that's exactly what we find in the Gospels. Jesus begins to heal and to restore and even to resurrect so that those that Satan had claimed as his own were being reclaimed by the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Everybody who has put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has been reclaimed from Satan and his captivity. Number three, the victory was achieved where, everyone? Cross. On the cross. That's exactly right. We'll spend a lot of time on that this evening. Number four, the victory was proclaimed by the resurrection. resurrection. Very good. The victory is continued in the church. the church. That's right. In all of our lives, the victory of Christ over Satan is being carried out in this present world. And number six, the victory is concluded in Revelation chapter 20 when Satan himself is dealt that final death blow. The end of Satan, the victory concluded when he is cast into the lake of fire. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That is going to be a glorious day. We also read Revelation chapter 12 through in its entirety. And we saw the five central elements of Revelation chapter 12. Number one was the woman. Now what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? The church or the people of God, the wily dragon. Who is the dragon in Revelation chapter 12? Satan. That's right, Satan or Satan. The war, remember, war broke out in heaven. heaven. That's right. Remember, the war begins in heaven, but where will that war be concluded? 
on earth. That's exactly right. Number four, the weapon. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, the cross of Jesus Christ. Number five, the winners. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, a powerful verse. It says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Verse 11 also says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation in the 12th chapter. Revelation chapter 12, last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 12. Now last night was the war behind the wars part one, tonight the war behind the wars part two. Let's look at Revelation chapter 12 and hone in on verse 10, verse 10. It says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been what, everyone? Yes. Cast down. Now you can actually fill that in right there. That verse, Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, is the blanks that should be filled in there under the subheading of the cross. Now who remembers how many times does that word cast occur here in Revelation chapter 12? Five times. Three times in verse 9 alone, and then two other times. He was cast out, he was cast out, he was cast out. There on your study guide, it says the blank of blank is Revelation's blank. The cross of Jesus Christ is Revelation's weapon. Beloved, you cannot fight the devil in your own strength. You cannot fight the devil with your fists. In order to overcome Satan, we need a weapon far more powerful than that, far more spiritual than that. The only thing that we can employ to overcome Satan and his sophistries is the cross of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? In fact, look at verse 11. We just read Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Look now at verse 11. It says, And they overcame him by the what, everyone? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So that's what you'd write in there under numbers 1 and 2. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The blood was shed where, everyone? On the cross. And by the word of their testimony. And so there at the bottom of that first page of the study guide, it says, that is the cross and the individual's personal experience with that cross. Think of it this way. Jesus' death on the cross is an historical event. What kind of event, everyone? A historical event. Happened some 2,000 years ago. But that historical event will not benefit you in an eternal sense unless you accept it as your personal salvation. Jesus is the Savior of the world, but in order for it to benefit you in an eternal sense, He has to become your personal Savior. Can you say amen? That's why it says there in verse 11, they needed both things. They needed the historical fact of Jesus' death, and then they needed their own testimony with that historical fact. And beloved, Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Jesus is alive. I'm on page two now of the study guide. Now we say, sure, Satan was cast out. But why did God wait? How many times I have heard the question, why didn't God just destroy the devil right at the beginning? How many people here have ever thought that or heard that question before? I mean, if God knew that the devil was going to do what he did, why didn't he just destroy him right at the outset? That is an excellent question. Notice the, the top of page two in the study guide. It says, as we discovered last lesson, Satan was cast out of heaven following Jesus' death on the cross. I quote for you very quickly John chapter 12 and verse 31. Remember what Jesus said? Now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And then verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus says in the context of the cross, Satan was cast out. In the context of the cross, Satan's insinuations and accusations were judged and he was cast to the earth. Now you're still there in Revelation chapter 12. Notice with me verse 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12. What's the first word, everyone? Therefore. therefore. And when you see the word therefore in the Bible, you ask yourself, what's it? Therefore. therefore. That's right. Therefore, on the basis of the fact that Satan has been cast out, 
Therefore, on the basis of the fact that the kingdom of God has come and the power of His Christ, therefore rejoice who, according to that verse? Heaven. O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Why? Because the devil has come down to you having what, everyone? Great wrath, because he knows that he has just a short time. Fascinating, isn't it? What John here is saying is, if you live in heaven, then rejoice, because Satan has been cast out. If, however, you live on the earth, woe to you. The word woe means doom. It means danger. Watch out. Then look at verse 13. It says, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. And who's the woman, everyone? The church. He persecuted the church. And this attack on the church reach, reaches its climax, its escalation in verse 17. Look at that. And the dragon was enraged. Old King James, wroth with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now look at this. Right there at the top of the second page. As we discovered last lesson, Satan was cast out of heaven following Jesus' death on the cross. Now this will be new for some of you, so listen very carefully. Prior to this, Satan still had limited access to heavenly beings. You say, what? There was limited access? Absolutely. Open your Bible to the book of Job. What book, everyone? Job. Job. That's in the Old Testament. If you open right up to the middle of your Bible, you'll probably be in Psalms. And it's the book immediately before Psalms. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Beginning in verse 6, Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Now we're not told where this heavenly council is convened. It doesn't say where it took place. But we know by the context that it didn't take place on planet earth. You say, well, how do you know that? I'll explain in just a moment. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and who also came among them? Yeah, that's right. The devil comes walking in. Oh, hey, I, you're all here. I just thought I'd come and join. Now watch what happens next. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? In other words, where are you coming here from? Now if they were on planet earth, God wouldn't have asked that question. He'd say, where are you from? Well, what do you mean where am I from? I'm here where I've always been. He asks the question, where are you from? And I want you to notice his response. So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. He basically says, oh, I've come from earth. Now again, we don't know exactly where this heavenly council was convened, but we know it must have been somewhere other than this earth. Verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? It's very interesting when God says to Satan, where are you coming from? And he says, earth. What he's basically saying is, oh, you know, just walking to and fro down on my planet. You know, just thought I'd show up to your little meeting here from my place. And God says, wait a minute. You think that's your place? Have you thought about my servant Job? My servant Job doesn't go along with your plans. My servant jo Job doesn't go along with your principles. Then Satan raises an accusation against God. He raises a what, everyone? An accusation. We already saw that in Revelation chapter 12 that Satan is called the accuser. Now notice this accusation in verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? He basically says, Are you kidding? Of course he's obedient. Verse 10, Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Is that an accusation, yes or no? I mean, think of basically what he's saying. That would be like me saying, you know, uh, I'm talking to someone and I say, oh, my wife loves me so much. And they say, yeah, right. You think your wife loves you. She only loves you because you buy her all those flowers. 
<laughs> if my wife wasn't here, I'd say a lot more. But uh, um, uh, you love her because you're so nice to her. I'm trying to come up with something here. Sorry, sweetheart. Didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. But you can just imagine, you know, if I said, oh, my wife and I, we have a wonderful relationship. And someone comes in and says, you don't have a good relationship with your wife. In fact, the only reason your wife likes you at all is that you do a bunch of good stuff for her. Her appreciation of you is not really for you. It's just because of the goodies. Is that an accusation, yes or no? Now get this whole scene in your mind. I mean, it's really an amazing scene. God here has convened a heavenly council. And all of the sons of God, these must be heavenly intelligences of some kind, have presented themselves before God. And, and here comes the devil walking into the assembly. God says, hey, what are you doing here? Oh, you know, I've just been walking down on my planet, just hanging out on planet Earth. You think that's your planet? What about my servant Job? He doesn't go along with you, with your governing principles and with your ways. Oh, Job. I mean, really? The only reason that Job loves you, the only reason that Job respects you, is that you take care of him and you give him good stuff. Is that an accusation, yes or no? It's a huge accusation, and it is only a case in point of the very kinds of accusations that Satan raised against God beginning back in heaven. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It says, and war broke out in heaven. Now that word war there is a very interesting word. You might want to make just a note of this. The word war is the Greek word polemia. Polemia, P-O-L-E-M-I-A would be the English transliteration. Now think about that. There's an English word called polemics. How many of you have heard that word before, polemics? It's basically arguing. The, the Bible says when war broke out in heaven, the primary manifestation of that war, listen very carefully, was not physical. It was not what, everyone? Physical. The word polemia means it was a war of words. It was a war of ideas. It was a war of accusations and insinuations. How many of you have ever heard of the Christian writer, well-known Christian writer, C.S. Lewis? Raise your hand. Excellent. Love that, brother. One of my all-time favorite Christian authors. He wrote a book entitled, God is in the Dock. God is in the Dock. Now, C.S. Lewis was an Englishman. And in the English court, the dock was the place that the person was on trial gave their defense. How many of you knew that? So when C.S. Lewis says, God is in the dock, what he's saying is, God is on trial. Accusations have been raised against God, incidentally. Many people in modern times have picked up on Satan's accusations. You can read in your own insurance policies that there are certain ways that the insurance companies can get out of paying you because of acts of God. Have you read that? And the acts of God is anything bad that happens in the world. We have this idea, God is the causer of bad things. But we've already seen in our study, when Jesus found that woman there and healed her, he said, whom Satan has, do you remember? Bound. And also when, when he spread the good seed out and then the weeds came up, the servants came and said, hey, where did all the weeds come from? And remember, he said five words, and enemy has done this. These so-called acts of God are not acts of God at all. God is getting a very bad rap in the universe. These accusations are being leveled against him. Go back to your study guide. So according to Job, we see that sometime after the creation event, Satan had limited access. What kind of access? limited access to heavenly intelligences. But at the cross, that access ceased. And that's why John says in Revelation, rejoice, who everyone? Amen. Oh heavens. Because at the cross, at the cross, all of the onlooking heavenly intelligences, all of heaven saw that Satan was a murderer. In fact, let's continue on right there in your lesson. The cross convinced the universe that Satan's ideas, plans, and accusations were groundless and false. But why didn't God just destroy Satan right at the beginning? After all, he certainly knew what was going to happen with Satan's rebellion. In order to understand this, we go back to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Go to Matthew chapter 13, first book of the New Testament. Now tonight, how many of you again have ever asked yourself that question? If God knew what the devil was going to do, why didn't he just 
shoom, snuff him out right at the beginning. Raise your hand. Have you ever wondered that? Okay, here's the answer. Here's the answer. It's the biblical answer, and it's a powerfully logical, compelling answer. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew what chapter, everyone? 13. 13. We're going back to that parable. The parable of the man who sowed the seeds in the field. Matthew chapter 13. We'll pick it up in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed what kind of seed in his field? Good seed. Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said, Sir, did you not, did, do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? In other words, where did all of these weeds come from? He said to them, five words, say it with me, An enemy has done this. Exactly right. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? Hey, we'll do you a favor and we'll gather up all the bad stuff. Notice his response. But he said what? No. Why? Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Now look at verse 30. This is the key. Let both grow, what everyone? Together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now remember, we don't have to wonder what this parable means because we can go right down to Jesus' own interpretation in verse 37. Look at verse 37. He who sows the good seed is who, everyone? Son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now look at this. The harvest is... Yeah, the end of the world. Your Bible maybe says world. My Bible says the end of the age. And that's actually the word. It's not the word for world in, in the sense of this terra firma, this planet. It's the end of the age, the end of this era. You have to wait until the harvest. Wait until the what, everyone? Harvest. Are there any gardeners here this evening? Any gardeners? You have green thumb? Anyone here? Okay, just about two of you. <laughs> okay, well listen, then you're exactly the reason why this parable will make so much sense, okay? We're reading right from our study guide. It can be difficult to distinguish desirable plants and non-desirable weeds when they first begin to sprout. Is that true or false? Absolutely, sure, especially to the uninitiated, which is apparently every single person in this room. To the uninitiated gardener, they can look almost what? Identical. Even after weeks of growth, certain weeds to prove to be almost indistinguishable from certain plants. Yet the difference is clear to the seasoned, experienced gardener. Remember what they said? Hey, do you want us to go and gather up the bad stuff? Jesus said, no, 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 no. Because if you do that, you will also pull up some of the good. Why? Because when something first starts to grow, it can be difficult to distinguish it, the good, from the bad. Are we all clear on this? Yes or no? See, now the parable is really starting to come alive. Look at this. Only at, what would, what would go in there? The harvest. Can the inexperienced see the true difference between the weeds and the wheat? I mean, anybody can tell the difference between a thistle and a tomato when they're full grown. But when they're just beginning to poke their little uh, heads, I know I use that term, up through the dirt, it can be difficult. But when you have the full-grown tomato plant and the full-grown thistle, anyone can tell the difference at the harvest. At the what, everyone? The harvest. Now, does anyone here eat thistles? Does anyone here eat artichokes? Okay, then you eat thistles. <laughs> The artichoke is a thistle. Many people don't know that. Anyway, I just thought I'd play a little trick on you there. <laughs> now look at this. This is exactly what Jesus' parable is designed to teach. Look at the next paragraph. God knew from the beginning the terrible direction that Satan was headed. Can you say amen to that? I mean, is that true? Sure it is. Think of this. 
The parable of the wheat and the tares is a powerful parable that helps us to understand why God didn't just cut Satan off at the very beginning. Okay? The harvest, something about the harvest, when the weeds and the wheat, in this context, when evil and good had come to full fruition, then everyone would be able to see what God could see from the beginning. You're getting it. That's exactly right. Look at John chapter 8, verse 44. I'll put it up here on the screen for you. This is the words of Jesus. Okay, look at this. Speaking, he said, you are of your father, the devil. Now look at this. He was a, what's that word? A murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. Now, isn't that interesting? He was a murderer from the beginning. But when really did he commit his greatest act of murder? It's when he took Jesus and nailed him to that cross. Now, you say, well, God knew that Jesus was going to come. Jesus came to die, of course. But God certainly did not intend that he would have to die that hideous, terrible, ignominious, humiliating death that he did. It was the devil that designed the cross. It was the devil who invented that thing so he could stick the Son of God on it and mock him. In fact, how many of you have ever heard the word excruciating? You hit your, you hit your, oh, hit your thumb with a hammer and you say, oh, that's an excruciating pain. The word excruciating comes from two words, ex, which means out of. If you turn to the back there, you see exit signs. Ex means out. And crucia, which is the cross. The word excruciating means out of the cross. It was a word that was coined by the Romans because crucifixion was so horrific, so painful, so terrible. People would be literally existing right on the verge of death and life, sometimes for more than a week in total pain. It was designed in the bowels of hell itself to bring maximum pain and torture to an individual. Excruciating is out of the cross. Now, God could look down when Satan began his rebellion there in heaven. God could look down through the corridors of time, and he could see that Satan would one day kill Jesus on the cross. Could God see that, yes or no? Sure he could, absolutely. That's why Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning. Now, notice this quotation. This is from the epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. John says... Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, go back to your study guide there. God knew from the beginning the terrible direction that Satan was headed. But here is an important point. The angels didn't see it so clearly. Think of it this way. Just imagine with me that there's a terrible scandal that breaks out in the, in the White House. A terrible scandal. And one of the closest individuals to the president begins to accuse him of all kinds of moral impurities and all kinds of money laundering. And it's a huge scandal in the White House. And there's one person who's willing to ring the bell. There's one person who says, he did it. I know it all. I've got it all documented. He's a bad guy in the moral area. He's a bad guy in the financial area. He's He's not what you think. Raising these accusations, people say, whoa, we didn't think that. Oh, really, really? Give us the documentation. And then suddenly, he turns up dead. What do you suspect immediately if he turns up mysteriously dead? What do you think about his accusations now? They were probably true. He was on to something. Now think about this in the context of all of heaven. Satan begins to raise his accusations. Satan begins to raise his insinuations. Satan begins to basically say, I could govern the universe better than God could. And we'll look at that here in just a moment. And if all of a sudden Satan turns up missing, the other angels would have thought, well, I wonder why that is. I mean, what's God so afraid of? I mean, why get rid of Satan in, in such a quick way? Why get rid of Satan so unceremoniously? Number one. And number two, they would begin to serve God potentially out of fear. And perfect love casts out all 
fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The service of fear is not an acceptable service to God. Now, fear is a motivator, but it cannot be the primary motivator. Can someone say amen? And so God could see it. God could see it as plain as the noonday sun, exactly where this rebellion was going to lead, but for the benefit of the other angels, the other heavenly intelligences, and frankly, for the benefit of you and me, God lets this thing play out until the harvest, and we all can see plain as the noonday sun, that's the devil, that's Christ, I choose to stand with Christ. If that makes sense, say amen. Powerful. Now, let's go back to our study guide here. Here's an important point. The angels didn't see it so clearly. Think of this. Satan's arguments, ideas, and insinuations must have been very persuasive indeed. Don't forget that he deceived a full one-third of the angels. Let me ask you a Bible question here. What is the first adjective that is used to describe Satan in the Bible? Subtle, that's exactly right. Genesis chapter 3, we read it yesterday. It says that the serpent, and of course it was Satan that, that inhabited the serpent at that moment. It says the serpent, Satan, was more subtle. He's subtle. He's manipulative. He's persuasive. What word, everyone? Persuasive. persuasive. You've got it. A full one-third of the angels. God allowed Satan to come to this planet to demonstrate his way of running things, his governing principles. The angels and the entire onlooking universe was then invited to watch and see. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. See if you can get there before me. 1 Corinthians, are you there? Okay, you beat me. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm there. 1 Corinthians, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you've got Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, okay? 1 Corinthians, I still hear, still hear the pages rustling. Don't worry, we'll wait for you. 1 Corinthians, chapter, what everyone? 4. Now look at verse 9. Wow, this is an amazing verse. Verse 9, Paul says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Now, my Bible says a spectacle. Does any other version here say something different? Do you have another version? A theater. I heard someone say it. In my Bible, there's a little marginal reference there. That's a little number one. And it means I look over into the margin, and the word is a theater. Let me read it to you with that word. We, it says, God has displayed us the apostles last as men condemned to death, for we have been made a theater to the world, both to angels and to men. The Greek theater and the Roman theater was something common in the days of Paul. And Paul here chooses that word theater. What he basically says is, we're on the stage. As Shakespeare said, all the world is a stage, but here that's really true. Just as, as Satan presented himself before the sons of God, and he's, oh, I've been walking back and forth on my planet, and God says, but what about my servant Job? Job was on the stage of life. The Apostle Paul says we're on a stage, and it's not a game, beloved. It's a real-life experience, a stage, and people are looking in to see what we will choose. Whose side will we stand on? Whose governing principles will we follow? Will we believe the lies and the persuasion and the insinuations of Satan, or will we stand on the side of God? Go to your study guide there. You can fill it in. He says we are made a theater to the world, both to angels and to men. Beloved, what we're trying to do here, and I hope we're succeeding, by the grace of God, I hope I'm succeeding, is to help you see that there is a big picture. A what, everyone? A big... Your salvation is not just about you. 
Your salvation is not just about you. There are larger issues at stake, namely the vindication of God's own character. Satan has raised radical insinuations about God's character. Beloved, when we take a stand for Jesus, we're saying to the whole onlooking universe, I reject Satan's lies. I reject Satan's propaganda. I will stand with Jesus. Powerful. I'm trying to paint the big picture here. There are two great revelations of the cross. You can fill it out there in your study guide. The cross teaches us two things powerfully, amazingly, and unequivocally. God's love for sinners and God's hatred for sin. In fact, if you think about it, God is in a real pickle. Because the supreme object of God's love, sinners is bound up inexorably with the supreme object of his hatred, sin. God has to perform the most difficult operation in all of the universe, a sin endectomy. He has to take the supreme object of his love and separate that from the supreme object of his hatred because God hates sin, but he loves sinners. The problem that he has is that half the time we love sin. The two great revelations of the cross, God's love for sinners and God's hatred of sin. Now, go to Isaiah chapter 14. We've actually already been to this before, but let's look at this. By the grace of God, you are going to see this big picture here in a way that you may have never seen it before. We're going to Isaiah. Isaiah 14. Now we've been here before, and here's what I want you to do. In Isaiah chapter 14, just lost my place there. Go to Isaiah chapter 14, and then go keep your finger there, or put something there, like I have one of these little fancy ribbons here, so I'm going to put it right there, and then go to Philippians chapter 2. That's in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2. Okay? So you've got one hand in Isaiah 14, one hand in Philippians 2, okay? I'll give you time to get there, don't worry. So, one is in Isaiah what, everyone? 14, and the other is in Philippians 2, okay? Keep your fingers right there. And you say, well, why do we need to do that? Because we're going to be flipping, just like that, okay? Here we go. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. These are the thoughts of Satan himself. For you have said in your heart... I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most what, everyone? High. So take a look at your study guide there. Five steps, very different directions. This next part of our study is both stunning and easily understood. In a simple comparison of two passages, we will see the essence of the character of God as contrasted with the essence of the character of Satan. Prepare to be amazed and humbled by the infinite and illimitable love of God. Satan's five steps up is what you'd write in there. Five steps up. Notice the upward direction of all of these verses. I will, what everyone? Ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I will sit on the mount. Is a mount a high thing or a low thing? High thing. On the con in the congregation of the north. North is at the top. You look at a map, north is up. Number four. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, I will be like the most high. You've got it. So if you look at this verse, it's very simple. Satan says, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up. I want to be higher than the position, the office that God has appointed me to. Satan's basically saying, I could do it better than God could. If I was running things, it would be better and different. I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up. Now keep your finger right there in Isaiah and flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians, what chapter everyone? 2. Beginning in verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in what everyone? 
Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now the Greek here is a little complicated, but basically what it says is he was God and so it was not something that he had to lay hold on to be God. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now look at that. These are Jesus Christ's five steps down. He made himself of no reputation. Who else could make God of no reputation? The only being in the universe that could humble God is God. Does that make sense? I mean, who else could do it? No one. If anyone's going to humble God, it has to be God himself. He made himself of no reputation. That's a choice that God made. He stepped down. He took the form of a servant. Think of it. The infinite, eternal, omnipotent, omnibenevolent God of the universe not constrained by either time or space, condescended to become like a slave. Number three, became in the likeness of a what, everyone? A man. I mean, think of it. Let's just say for, for sake of illustration, he was six foot tall. Here you have the illimitable, infinite God of the universe confining himself to a man that's six feet tall. As if that wasn't enough, God, the very fountain of life, became obedient to death. Even the death, not a noble death, not a death where he looked like a hero and he said, oh, look at how wonderful he is, look at how great he is. No, no, no. He died bruised and beaten and bloodied and battered and naked on a pathetic cross that was designed to torture common criminals. Jesus looked down from heaven when he saw Adam and Eve fall, and when he saw you fall, and when he saw all of us fall. The, the love of God and the love of Jesus compelled them. It forced them into action. They said, I will come down from my lofty throne. I will come down from my lofty sphere. Down, 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 just to rescue my children. Now, keep your finger right there in Philippians and watch this. This is awesome, okay? So look what I'm doing here, okay? Repeat after me. Here's Philippians right here, and here's Isaiah, okay? Now, watch what happens. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and then get ready to whoop, flip right over to Philippians, okay? Isaiah 14, okay? Verse 13, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up. Look at verse 15, yet you will be brought down. Isn't that interesting? His desire is to go up, but the end result is he will be brought down. Now look at Philippians 2. Look at this. Philippians 2, we've already read it. Verse 8, And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. Of course, who else could humble God but God? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the pathetic, ignominious death of the cross. He went down, 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 down. Verse 9, Therefore, remember when you see the word therefore, ask yourself, Hey, what's that therefore? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of all things under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Can you say amen? amen. Do you see the contrast? Yes or no? Satan says, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up, I'll go up. I want to be more than the office that God has appointed me to. And God says, in your desire to go up, you'll be brought down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. And then Jesus says, I'll go down. I'll lay my crown aside, I'll go down. I'll lay my throne aside, I'll go down. I will go down for the benefit of others. Down, 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 hanging, bruised and beaten and humiliated, falsely accused, spat upon, His beard torn out on a cross. 
He went to the bottom, to the dregs, to the basement, to the lowest place, and God says, I will exalt him. Powerful. Look at the bottom of page three there. At the end, however, Satan is cast down and Christ is exalted. Can someone say amen? amen. Powerful. On the cross, I mean, think of it. You're an angel. You're one of the two-thirds of the loyal angels. I mean, think about it. One-third followed Satan, and the two-thirds remained loyal. But still, you must know that there, there must have been at least questions in their mind. Of course, they were loyal to God, but they always wondered, what's Satan up to? I mean, a full one-third, it's very much like our own civil war. The Mason-Dixon line is drawn and people on this side and people on that side and the angels were always kind of thinking the loyal, hmm, I, I wonder what this is all about. And then they saw Golgotha. And they saw the devil in all of his satanic fury lay the precious Son of God down, humiliate him, pull out his beard. And they, no, no, they said, no, surely, surely, surely he's not. And they saw him do it. And when they saw that, when they looked down, I, I, I can't believe it. He's not, he's going to do it. When they saw that, when they saw what happened on the cross, their minds were made up. You say amen? I mean, they, they were already loyal. And they said, we don't know. We don't have all the answers. But we don't want to have anything to do with this devil. And therefore, he was cast out. Not even limited access anymore to heaven. That's why it says, rejoice, O heavens. But there is one planet, one place where that decision has not been made. That's this planet. And something interesting is that this planet is not going to make that decision wholesale. We'll make that decision as individuals. God isn't going to save this whole planet. Someone say amen. You see, here it's different. With us, it's different. With us, individuals will make the decision. I will align myself with Satan and with his governing principles, or I will align myself with Christ and his governing principles. And if you're having difficulty making that decision, look at the cross. Satan says, I'll go up, 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 up at the expense of others. Christ says, I'll go down, 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 down just to save others. Look there at your study guide at the bottom. One embodies almost reckless condescension for the benefit of others. That's Jesus. Condescension for the... Almost reckless. I mean, he throws away his crown. He throws away his throne. He says, I'm going down. Got to get my children. The other embodies calculated exaltation at the expense of others. Last page. Just think of it. The infinite, illimitable God of the universe condescended to become a man. More than this, he condescended to die. And even more than this, he condescended to be ridiculed, mocked, and die the ignominious death of a common criminal. What love, what marvelous condescension, what absolute selflessness. The word condescend has at its root word descend. What does descend mean? To go down. The prefix con means together. So the word condescend means that he goes down together with us. Is there anyone in this room who's ever been at the bottom? Anyone want to raise their hand? I've been at the bottom. Well, Jesus has been there too. He came down to get me and to get you. That's what the word condescend means. By his incomparable love. You've heard it before, but, it, but it's become so quaint. We've seen it, on, on, we, we've, we've seen it at, at football stadiums. We've, we've seen it all over. I mean, it's, it's almost quaint now. I mean, it rolls off the tongue so easily, so readily. Oh, yeah, 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 I've heard that verse before. Half the time, as a minister of the gospel, when I say, open up your Bibles to John 3, 16, 90% of the people don't even open up their Bibles. And say, oh, I know that one. Been there, done that. Beloved, think of it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him wouldn't perish but live forever. Can you say amen? amen? I mean, this verse is for you, beloved. This verse is for you. And this verse is for me. And jump down there to the, second par or the third paragraph. The cross of Jesus Christ is the very center of it all. 
The cross alone enables us to make sense out of this troubled and sin-filled world in which we live. The cross of Jesus Christ utterly demonstrates God's character as a character predominated and characterized by love. But it also upholds the principles of His justice. That's what you'd write there. It also upholds the principles of His justice. God couldn't just forgive sin willy-nilly. Well, you know, I changed my mind about the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. No, sin is a hatred thing. It's a violation of the very character, the very eternal law of God. And so God is in a real pickle here, isn't He? He needs to uphold His loving character, but not compromise His justice. Well, how, pray tell, can He do that? It upholds the principles of His justice and His eternal law. More on that later. Yes, at the cross... Both God's love and His justice were plainly and perfectly demonstrated. If that makes sense, I want you to say amen. amen. Psalm 85 and verse 10 is right there in your sheet. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. On the cross, God didn't have to lay aside His law and His justice and His character in order to save us. But he did have to put his son on a cross. Friends, if God could have just changed his mind willy-nilly, Jesus wouldn't have gone to the cross. The fact that Jesus hung on the cross is proof that God's character is immutable. It cannot change. The principles of his law cannot just be laid aside. The fact that Jesus died on that cross is proof positive that God's justice is not up for negotiation, but neither is His love, and there was only one way. And Jesus says, I'll go down. I'll go down. I'll go all the way down. This verse, beloved, this verse is for you. Now, at this time, I'm going to invite my good friend Clint to come up, and our ministry partners are going to distribute to you a card. I'd like to ask my ministry partners just, partners just to stand up right now and distribute those cards. You're going to get a card right now. Now, as they're distributing this card, I want to ask you a question tonight. Number one, has this presentation made sense? Say amen if it's made sense. Okay. You're getting a card. This is a decision card. A what, everyone? And you'll notice on there, it doesn't say decision for David Asherick. It says decision for who, everyone? Decision for what does it say? Christ. Beloved, tonight we have done our very best to present to you the big picture. The big picture, the big conflict between the character of Christ, the character of God, and the character of the enemy. There is a war behind the wars, and that war is being waged right here, right now, in your life and in this room. Take a look at that card. There are several boxes here that could be checked. Number one, I understood tonight's presentation. First of all, please fill out your name, your address, all of that. We're going to have to have that information. If you're making a decision tonight for Christ, we want to follow that up. We want to stand with you on the side of Jesus. Please, as a personal favor to me, fill that out. Put your name down. Put your address down. Put your contact information down, please. Number one, I understood tonight's presentation. If you need a pen, just raise your hands high to heaven. Michael's here with pens. Number one. Number two, I reaffirm my personal acceptance of Jesus Christ's death for me. Okay, you want to do that? You mark that down. You check that. You say, yes! Maybe you've done it before, but you see it tonight, you say yes and yes again. Number three, for the first time, there's not a doubt in my mind that there is someone in here tonight who's never made this decision, someone in here tonight who's never understood it as you've understood it tonight, that Jesus came down for you so that you could live forever. His righteousness becomes your righteousness. Your unrighteousness becomes His unrighteousness. There's a divine exchange that takes place. He suffered the death which was yours. You can live the life which is His. You can check that number three. You say, for the first time, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior from sin and death. Number four, I have wandered from God and His plan for my life, and I want to return to Him. If that describes you, you check that. We want to meet with you. We want to pray with you. We want to minister. Whatever we can do to help you, we're here. Say, I've wandered from God. Some of you have wandered from God, and you've been a long way for a long time. Well, tonight is the night to wander back. 
Number five, I would like to be baptized. Perhaps you've not been baptized. Perhaps you've not made that decision to, to make a full commitment to Christ and to go through the biblical ceremony of baptism. You mark that. Number six, I would like a personal visit. Number seven, I need special prayer for. Please fill that card out. And here's what's going to happen. My good friend Clint McCoy, who's going to be doing our concert tomorrow night, is going to sing us a song entitled, Give Me Jesus. And when that song is done, the ministry partners are going to collect these cards. Please don't slide these cards into your Bible. Give them to the ministry partners. They go to me. I pray over every card. Beloved, I love you very much. And tonight I want you to see that God loves you dearly. Amen? Amen. Clint. In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise In the morning when I rise Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, oh, to die, give me Jesus, and give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world. Yes, you can have all this world. Just give me Jesus.